Your conference is being recorded. Good afternoon. Who just joined the call? This is Darius Knight. Hey, Darius. How are you? I'm all right. How about yourself? I'm good. Hannah, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, I think right. we're good. Good to go. All right. Let's go. All right. Okay. Hi, everybody. Hope everybody's doing well and uh, doing the best we can under these extraordinary moments that we're living in right now. Um, so the record is clear. My name is Gail Carr Williams, and I am the board chair for the National Metropolitan Transit Authority. Uh, thank you all for joining um, this telephone conference today. And again, due to the continued COVID-19 pandemic and the continued uh, declaration of a state of emergency by Governor Bill Lee, uh, I'm getting a little pushback. Hold on one sec. Still there, Gail? Okay. Yeah, I'm still here. I was getting a lot of feedback in the ear. So, okay. So, due to the COVID 19 pandemic, and the continued declaration of state of emergency by Governor Bill Lee. Similar to our March meeting and our April meeting, board meeting, we're holding this special limited agenda meeting without objection via telephone conference in order to continue to conduct the essential MTA business while protecting the health, safety, and welfare of Tennesseans during this pandemic. This meeting will be held in accordance with Governor Lee's executive order number 16, in, in order for us to uh, approve our April board meetings and to discuss the mobility on demand first last mile pilot and the fiscal year 2020-21 operating budget. This meeting is necessary and limited to these important agenda items. This meeting will not include committee meetings nor public comments or chair or CEO typical reports. So the first order of business is for me to say I do miss very much being in person with all of you all to conduct this business. <laughs> um, but I'm grateful that you all would take the time to still come on telephonically for us to be able to do this and to continue the work of MTA we go. And again, to address my thanks for all of MTA and we go that are out there every day doing the work that I believe is heroic at this time. So thank you all very much. So the first order of business is roll call. So if I call your name, if you could just say your name and that you are present. Um, and these are board members. Janet Miller. Uh, present. And will you say your name just so the record is clear? Oh, I'm sorry. Janet That's Miller okay. is present. Okay. Hannah Paramore Breen. Hannah Paramore Breen, present. And Walter Searcy? Walter Searcy, present. Thank you. So we do have all of our board members present and that we are now with the uh, with Glenn Farner leaving the board last month. Uh, we are, the four of us are here, so great. So also if I can see if other members of the staff are here and also our general counsel. If you could just say your name and uh, say you're here, I will keep up with that attendance. Just Margaret Bam. Oh, I'm sorry. Sue, I thought you were going to. No, no, so I right did ahead. say that when I started doing something totally different. You know, I'm going to blame it on being at home all the time. <laughs> sorry. Go, Margaret. I'm sorry. All right. Uh, Secretary and General Counsel, Margaret Bam, present. Steve Bland. Uh, Steve Bland, CEO, present. Rita Roberts Turner. Chief Administrative Officer, Rita Roberts Turner, present. Uh, CFO, Ed Oliphant. Ed Oliphant, CFO, is present. 
And so the others that are there that are staff members, can you just say your name and um, let us know your title? This is Stan Freudberg, Director of Service Quality. Thanks, Stan. Eric Byer, Director of Legislative Relations. Eric Byer, okay. Monica House, Board Liaison. And I believe we have Jason Menzer. Jason, are you on the line? Yep, Jason Menzer, Director of Marketing and Communications. Okay, are there any other staff members that are on the line? Okay. It's Lydia Benta, Project Manager, Engineering and Construction. Okay. Thanks, Lydia. Okay, so we have a good roll call. So uh, now that we have roll call, if I can ask for a motion for approval of the April 23rd MTA board minutes. This is Hannah. I so move. And is there a second? Madam Chair, can I be recognized, Margaret Bim? Yes, uh, you may. I just have one amendment to our minutes. I know some were sent out earlier today with some amendments. And on item four, we just need uh, to add at the end of item four, there was no further discussion. The request was unanimously approved by the board in a roll call vote. So I ask that you all accept that amendment to uh, to the minutes. All right, so I don't think we have a second, but if there's a second to include that amendment. Second, Janet Miller. So we have the motion, then we have a second that includes the amendment by our, um, our board secretary. Um, all those in favor, if you would say your name and say yes or no. Well, Cersei, yes. Janet Miller, yes. Hannah Paramore Brain, yes. Gail Carr Williams, yes. Um, the, the minutes are approved with the changes suggested by our, our board secretary and general counsel. Thank you, Margaret, for, uh -huh. for that. Um, next, if I could call on um, Dan to uh, go over with us the mobility on demand first last mile pilot program. All right, thank you. Again, this is Dan Freudberg, Director of Service Quality with WeGo, and I will be reviewing our proposed mobility on demand, first and last mile project, and supporting partnership with transportation network company Uber. Uh, this material starts on page eight in the board packet. This presentation will review the need for such a program, alignment to agency strategy, key objectives, program design, potential issues and mitigations, and next steps. And given the limitations of a voice-only presentation like this, please feel free to uh, interrupt with questions or feedback as we go along, and there'll also be time for questions at the end. Access to transit is a prevalent and continuing challenge for current and potential WeGo customers. Limited pedestrian infrastructure and accessible travel paths combined with sprawling land use patterns make it difficult for many to access the bus network. At the same time, just disjointed street networks and a lack of population or employment density make it both inefficient and impractical to provide fixed route transportation in many areas. The InMotion Strategic Plan provides specific strategies and associated actions to address these challenges. One such strategy is to establish partnerships with private service providers, such as transportation network companies, that can provide demand responsive transportation. These partnerships can then be used to create on-demand services in specific geographic areas and provide trips that connect customers to the nearest frequent bus route. Staff have been working to convert these in motion recommendations into actionable pilot pro into an actionable pilot, pilot project that helps more customers bridge the first or last mile and access the fixed route bus network. Sorry, getting some feedback there. If you can go ahead and – there, sounds good. Thank you. This project will provide a proof of concept for a new service mode that can be used to provide context-sensitive service options that expand the geographic reach of public transit while increasing ridership and efficiency on our most frequent bus routes. Such a service can also provide customers with disabilities additional freedom by enabling them to use the broader fixed route bus network for more trips. With these objectives in mind, 
staff evaluated a variety of service models and example programs from other cities. In addition, they evaluated potential service areas within Nashville to identify candidate areas where a first and last mile service could be successful. A summary of programs across the U.S. as well as the evaluation criteria employed in selecting promising service areas is included in the appendix to this board item beginning on page 11 in your packet. The most promising initial pilot area identified is a service zone in Antioch anchored by bus stops on the Route 55 Murfreesboro, a frequent transit route with 12 to 15 minute weekday service. An overview of the service area, proposed operating model, and fare subsidy uh, structure is included in the appendix on page 15. Customers would book trips directly on the Uber app and have the subsidy automatically applied to their total fare. WeGo would also partner with one of our existing third-party access providers to provide an accessible option for customers who rely on cash, those without smartphones, and those requiring wheelchair-accessible vehicles. The recommended fare structure would ensure that most trips would cost customers about as much as the regular bus fare, while still providing a subsidy cap that limits agency cost exposure. In keeping the program focused specifically on increasing access to fixed route transit, only trips that start or end at a designated bus stop would be eligible for the subsidy. A pilot program of this nature is not without risks and challenges. If we go back to page 9 in your packet, the table under anticipated issues and mitigations provides an overview of the more pertinent items. Fortunately, WeGo has the benefit of being able to learn from other similar programs. In addition, staff have taken the time to carefully consider challenges and formulate appropriate mitigations to address said challenges, such as utilizing existing access providers as an option for customers without credit cards or smartphones. There will be unanticipated challenges as well, but a pilot, the pilot nature of the program will provide WeGo the flexibility to learn and adapt as these issues become apparent. Following today's meeting, staff will use any board questions and feedback to refine the program design, finalize business rules, and inform contractual negotiations with Uber. In addition to the agreement with Uber, WeGo will work closely with one or more access providers to define service and payment, serves, payment terms. Planning and other departments will also coordinate with Metro Public Works and others on passenger loading and unloading at key transfer points. We expect to bring an action item for approval of an agreement with Uber in June. However, the final launch timeline for the pilot program will depend on a significant improvement in conditions and easing of restrictions with respect to the COVID-19 pandemic. And with that, I'll open it up to any questions. So for, for the members, so we wanted to make sure that Dan was able to uh, revisit. This is a presentation you've had in the past just because we will have a um, hopefully a, a pretty soon agreement with Uber on this that Margaret and uh, Rita are working on now. Um, so frankly, we wanted to uh, refresh it in your memory and bring up any discussion points, questions, concerns uh, that we might incorporate before we bring back that final action item. And akin to when we started the access on demand pilot um, you know, our pilots are a good opportunity for us to kind of mold the program in a flexible manner as we see what, what comes out that's positive and maybe not so positive. So with that, uh, any questions or comments you have, would, we would be happy to entertain. Um, this, is, this is Janet Miller. Uh, talk about the fiscal impact here. Um, and if I'm missing it, it's, it, you know, you've got a lot of pages here, but what do we think this will cost net to WeGo um, after the payments and that sort of thing? Right. So we are uh, we've set aside about fifty thousand dollars for the pilot term, Janet. And again, it's a limited geography um, limited geography startup pilot. And again, uh, Dan touched on some of the mechanisms for us to be able to manage the fiscal exposure. Once we get a better sense of demand, if we were to expand the program, the real intent, again, and Dan outlined it, is to for that first mile, last mile connection to fixed route service in areas where it's 
frankly, not effective for us to run um, bus service. So through the course of the pilot, we have pretty limited fiscal exposure, and we can use that experience to, for lack of a better word, manage expectations. Other agencies that have put this in place have found it to be a, a really important connection, but have not found it to chew up a very significant piece of budget, for lack of a better word. And if you look at the um, kind of what that average subsidy per trip is, it is lower than um, our what I'll call our low ridership connector routes and pretty consistent with some of our higher performing connector routes, not the main trunk line routes, you know, the Nolansvilles and the Gallatin Roads, but certainly those cross town and uh, circulator routes, you know, that subsidy per passenger is right in line with sure. what we see there. Okay, that's great. I think it's a great program, and I think starting it in Antioch is a great idea because it's such a sprawling area. I think um, you'll see some good demand for the service there. This is Walt. Um, what's the and Dan? What's the incentive for wheelchair-bound persons to use this in lieu? To use this to get to a uh, trunk line versus calling an access, calling for an access ride. So this is Dan again. Uh, Walter, the uh, total trip cost, if you include a discount day pass on the fixed route and the connecting fare on this service, will be a bit less than what a round trip fare on access will be. Uh, however, we're also exploring um, whether additional incentives may make work, may make may make sense to encourage access customers to use the service beyond the, the base subsidies that are outlined here. Uber upgrading its service so that they have many more wheelchair carrying vehicles uh, because some people, again, certain persons are not able to transfer from a chair to a regular passenger vehicle. They need to remain in their chair. Just there, yeah. And, um, Uber. I think she was saying. You can do it wherever you want to as long as you can get it. Have major wheelchair capacity. If everyone can mute their phone, if they're not speaking, uh, we're having a little trouble hearing Walter. I'm sorry, Walter. Yeah. Do I need to repeat some of that? Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. I was saying that these third-party carriers uh, have a dearth of wheelchair uh, capacity vehicles. And... Uh, if without have without so many persons are not don't have the ability to transfer from a chair to a passenger vehicle, they would have to ride into the vehicle and remain in their chair. Um, the uh, if you have if the demand outstrips the supply. Um, then again, that's going to be a damper on the first mile, last mile usage or any other usage. I know an example uh, is just, I didn't need to do it, but I just uh, took an informal uh, survey uh, over a couple of weeks last year to determine the uh, both Uber and Lyft, how many access wheelchair access vans were available and each one of them had some but there was without exception a delay uh if you had to wait for that kind of vehicle uh uh a delay or simply the note the notice that we don't have any available at this time call us later Thank you, Walter. That's definitely um, an important consideration and one that many similar partnerships across the country have faced. We're fortunate to have uh, existing relationships with our uh, access providers that have uh, additional uh, wheelchair uh, capacity available, um, and they actually have more capacity available right now than we are using for access paratransit and for the Access on Demand program. So we'll be looking to partner with at least one, if not more than one of those providers, 
to provide that accessible transportation. In addition, if we do see an unexpectedly uh, an unexpected spike in demand for wheelchair accessible vehicles, we can always make use of our existing in-house resources if we need to to make sure that uh, that no customer is is left behind during the pilot program. And it's also something that we'll be monitoring carefully for uh, overall response times and, and available capacity. Great. Walter, this is Steve Bland again. One of, the, um, one of the advantages of this program, and frankly the way that Dan and his group have been sequencing it, by getting our feet a little bit wet, uh, for lack of a better term, with the Access on Demand program, uh, we've got pretty good experience with those operators, and you know we're pretty comfortable that they have the capacity to help us pick up that slack. You know, this will be a pertinent issue now because, and they are very much a part of the first mile, last mile, this broader solution beyond, you know, what our normal access service is. Um, recognizing the reach that companies like Uber and Lyft have, um, this Uber essentially becomes an additional operator. So they are not the sole operator. Obviously, we hope they grow their um, accessible vehicle capacity over time as that demand shows itself, but they are likely not going to be the primary provider for those types of trips initially. And again, for us, the, the benefit of trying this as a, as a pilot case in a manageable geographic area as we see what some of those issues are before we roll it out to other areas of the county, uh, we'll be able to kind of evaluate and try to mitigate any of those impacts. This is Gail, and um, I have a couple questions. One, I really like the fact that we're doing this in Antioch, um, and, of course, that uh, we tried that before with some on-demand, and we had good successes, and I think that people there um, uh, did appreciate the service. But the other question I have is, so when someone decides to use this service, what happens if they decide to – not go to the fixed route after sort of, you know, all of a sudden they look up and see traffic or they get comfortable in the car and decide I'm going to stay in. How do we, do we manage that? Or is there, if they decide not to leave the Uber and take their whole ride to wherever they're going, how does that really work? So, and again, this is Dan, on the Uber application, um, there will be uh, an automatic calculation as to whether the subsidy can apply to the trip or not based on where the driver ends the trip uh, or begins the trip for that matter if they're being picked up at the bus stop. If a customer elects to stay on board, uh, the, the only way in theory that that customer could still receive the subsidy is if the driver ended the trip pre prematurely at the stop, in which case they wouldn't be getting paid for the remainder of the trip. So that's pretty unlikely. Uh, so, so there is that protection in place. Uh, okay. For our other service providers, we'll receive detailed uh, invoice information uh, containing the exact uh, origins and destinations of each trip that we can audit uh, to make sure that, that customers are being picked up and or dropped off at the bus stops. So then there is a way to not pay past that if somebody made that choice. Right. And, and okay. on the on the Uber side, you know, so um, and Dan touched on in the experience we've had, and you know, and, and pretty good working relationships with the other operators. On the Uber side, it's been pretty well time tested in a number of other transit agencies, where this is used fairly extensively, as in some of the cities with rail systems that kind of feed into those rail stations. So the issue of having a geographic zone, you know, a, a system that permits trips from within a geographic zone to a particular point, you know, whether that be a rail station or a bus stop, has been pretty pretty time tested, um, you know, through the Uber and for that matter the Lyft apps, you know, if that were to come online. Okay. And the other question I have in in our contract with Uber or in this in these discussions. If there's person that's riding, say, a family of two or three, and they're all going to the fixed route, and so will Uber charge us for, or will they charge us for the trip? Uh, so we're we will still be working through those details with Uber uh, uh, between now and uh, when we come back for an action item. However, okay. uh, 
we are looking to work with Uber to use Uber Pool, which is their shared ride service option for this service. That is, of course, contingent on uh, lifting of restrictions related to the COVID-19 pandemic, as right now Uber has suspended all shared ride transportation for good reason. Um, and that service is currently uh, limited to up to two passengers per trip. Um, the uh, direct point-to-point non-shared ride service uh, was until recently up to four passengers that Uber has restricted that now to three, again, due to COVID-19 and not allowing passengers to ride in the front seat. But we would work with them on details. However, I would anticipate that we would be paying on a per-trip basis and not on a per-passenger basis, given that it doesn't cost us or them any more to serve additional passengers. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. I think that was maybe all the questions for me. Does anybody else have any questions? Any other thoughts? If that's the case, then uh, Dan, thank you very much for presenting this. This is uh, um, a lot to think about, but it's also something we've been talking about for a very long time. So it's exciting to sort of see it starting to um, get going. So I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, next on our agenda is the um, operating budget discussion with Ed. So at this point, I'm going to turn this over to Ed. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate it, Madam yeah. Chair. Um, welcome. Thank have... you for being here today. You're welcome. I'm glad I'm here. <laughs> That's so cool. You here? Um, you here? <laughs> we have on pages 18 through 42 a lot of information about the budget. Yeah. It's been an unusual uh, budget process this year, to say the least. And we will be bringing a proposed budget to the board next month after we get through our uh, council hearings and knowing exactly what it is. But in, in lieu of trying to go through all this information, I'm actually going to turn it over to Steve to give a very high-level recap and highlights of what we think is important at this point, and then we'll find out what's going on after the uh, council hearings on the 20th. So, Steve, if you'll take it over. Thanks, Ed, and uh, thank you all for participating in the board meeting today. Uh, as Ed alluded to, we have 24 pages in the board packet. I promise you that I'm not walking through this <laughs> page by page. I did want to hit some highlights and um, encourage your questions and discussion and message points because uh, I think Ed hit the nail on the head to say this was an unusual budget year. I guess they're all unusual yeah, in their own in way, their own but way, yeah. this certainly has been more unusual than most. And as a reminder, our budget hearing before the Budget and Finance Committee of the Metro Council is scheduled for 4.15 p.m. on Wednesday, May 20th. Uh, and we have submitted all, all board members' contact information to the council office. They are doing these hearings by WebEx. Um, I've actually watched a few of them. And it's actually going pretty smoothly, um, other than a couple little technical glitches. So you should be getting direct contact information from the council office with the links for you to be able to um, participate. Um, I'll give you the quick synopsis of everything. Uh, in short, rapid deterioration of the economy that we've seen coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic has forced Mayor Cooper to recommend some very drastic actions in his proposed 2021 operating budget. Um, I'm sure you all have uh, wide interests in what's in that budget, but the interest that's most pertinent to this board is his proposal uh, in terms of public transit funding out of the Metro General Fund, uh, including both RTA and MTA combined. He is recommending a uh, total reduction in funding from last year's levels of about $22.3 million. So between the two agencies, that would take us overall from $50,456,100 to $28,156,100. Um, fortunately, due to the availability of the emergency funding that we uh, have discussed previously from the Federal Transit Administration under the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act, or we're referring to it as the CARES Act, um, when Ed comes back to you next month with a budget, it will be balanced. Um, we will have revenues equaling expenses, proposed revenues equaling proposed expenses, 
and that will be able to do that without a negative impact on customers. So that will be assuring existing service levels and fare levels, um, thanks to the funding that we're receiving through the CARES Act. Unfortunately, as you're aware, um, you know we have pr we provide a two-tier budget request or status quo budget to sustain service and fare levels, and then our tier two budget. And in this case, we had recommended or requested about $2.2 million to start implementing some of the better bus improvements, and specifically for the upcoming fiscal year, because of the lead time to make changes, that $2.2 million would have covered about nine months of service hours extensions on a number of our routes. So we are not planning at this point to recommend that those service enhancements be adopted until we get a little bit more clarity as to the long-term um, financial scenarios that we're looking at. Um, with respect to um, COVID-19 direct impacts, as you're aware, and as um, I try to report now on a weekly basis with respect to COVID-19 to the board <clears throat> through um, through communication, um, after the early reports of coronavirus cases in early 2020, Mayor Cooper enacted his city's the city safer at home executive order on March 23rd. Prior to and ever since this order, we've been extremely fortunate to be benefiting from a partnership with Metro National's Health Department that continues uh, to this day and certainly through um, through the health crisis. And uh, as early as um, early mid-March, the health department met with us and our union leadership to review a lot of our procedures uh, and for us to improve our response to COVID-19. So part of the budget impact you're going to see is directly related to COVID-19. That includes additional expenses we're incurring, both in terms of staffing, supplies, equipment, and process for the enhanced cleaning and disinfecting procedures that we're seeing. Um, we've adopted four-day operator work weeks to relieve them of some of the time online, paid time off for some of our more vulnerable employees and those who might need to be quarantined um, as a result of either them or a, um, or a close contact being diagnosed with the virus. Uh, all of this done in close coordination with our union, ATU Local 1235, who have absolutely been outstanding partners in the effort. Um, this will come with a cost. In addition to that, with the Safer at Home order um, significantly restricting a lot of the economic activity in Nashville and the general downturn, downturn in the economy, we've seen a 65% reduction in our ridership. And also to um, promote not spreading the virus, we have relaxed our fare collection efforts. So, frankly, fare collection is uh, pretty minimal at this point in time, and that will also have a significant impact on our budget. Um, clearly, we're not unique. Every transit agency in the world is going through this, um, some with, frankly, even much greater impacts than what we're seeing in terms of both ridership and revenue loss, and economic impact. I know Gail and I were talking about uh, we continue to push for dedicated funding. And, you know, one of the impacts, particularly for those with economy-related funding sources like sales taxes, a lot of those transit agencies are really seeing a significant hit in those revenues. So in developing our planned program of projects for the CARES Act and that um, proposed program is contained in the, ba in the package of materials um, I believe in Appendix A, yep, in Appendix A on page 22 of your board packet, we really took several things into account. Um, the total share that MTA will see out of the CARES Act is a little bit over $55 million. Um, out of that, we are anticipating sustained to have to cover sustained operating revenue losses through the remainder of this fiscal year, all of fiscal year 2021, and part of fiscal year. 21-22, we're seeing additional operating expenses that we uh, kind of covered briefly uh, earlier, brought on by the pandemic, and we're estimating that to be an order of about $14 million. Um, the CARES Act also recommended that systems adopt capital projects that would help with resiliency and our ability to respond to uh, the pandemic or future um, events that might have a similar impact on our service. And working with our union, we've identified about $7 million in such um, projects. 
And of course, we anticipated um, that there would be a reduced fiscal ability by Metro Nashville to be able to support transit during a severe economic downturn. So based on um, these assumptions and uh, going back to Appendix A, we've essentially set aside about a total of $33, $34 million to help um, relieve the fiscal pressures on Metro Nashville during this period. $8.7 million of this is targeted toward replacing previously approved capital spending plan funds toward projects that are already, frankly, too far along um, to slow down or stop, and an additional $25.4 million in direct um, operating budget relief. On April 28th, Mayor Cooper released his uh, FY 2021 proposed operating budget to the council. It reflected um, a decrease in funding from prior year of about $22.3 million to the MTA and RTA, or about 44% of the total. And clearly, that cut was not due to any change in programmatic priorities. Um, the mayor and his staff continued to advance, albeit more slowly than he had hoped, um, a consolidated city transportation plan that continues to be a priority. Uh, but certainly it was uh, the result of direct fiscal pressure on this year's budget and, frankly, the fact that we are one of um, not a lot of functions in metro government that does have access to direct funding under the CARES Act to offset these impacts. Um, we had had earlier communications with Metro Finance about all of this and back and forth. And what we're projecting based on the mayor's proposed budget is if the budget's enacted, again, we get through this fiscal year um, completely unharmed, no need to reduce services, reduce employment levels, raise fares, um, but it, does, it will leave us a little bit thin going into fiscal year 21-22 with an estimated balance of about $5 million in CARES Act money to cover any shortfalls that we might see next fiscal year. Now, if uh, Metro determines they're able to continue to fund those previously approved capital projects, that could potentially add about $8.7 million to that number. So with $13, $14 million, that, that would be a much stronger cushion entering next year's operating budget. So with respect to what all this has to do um, with the MTA board and considerations you, you should be thinking about as we move forward, um, again, next month's um, presentation of the budget should be relatively straightforward and certainly much less painful than in some of our recent years. Uh, we anticipate bringing you a, a balanced budget that would sustain all existing services and fair levels. Uh, but frankly, we're going to have to monitor, and in talking with the mayor's office and Metro Finance, there, there has been expressed a clear intent on their part to restore us to full funding levels as the economy rebounds, as um, revenue sources like sales tax, hotel tax, et cetera, come back. Um, and they do feel as though the way that the budget has been prepared if it's adopted by the council substantially in its current form, um, they're optimistic that they will be in a position to do that next fiscal year, obviously recognizing that nobody truly knows what's going to happen between now and then. So from from our perspective, talking with Ed, um, internally we think it's going to behoove us to work very closely with Metro over the first six months of the fiscal year to monitor where things are from the standpoint of any economic rebound, where our ridership is headed, frankly, when we're even able to fully collect fares again, how that revenue rebounds. And in a worst-case scenario, um, and I don't want to oversell this, I certainly will not want to scare anyone in the public because we're not close to this point yet, but if um, through whatever combination of factors we are forecasting as of, say, the first of the calendar year, a more significant budget deficit than we are able to resolve through remaining available CARES Act money, we would have to consider um, some fairly drastic um, service impacts for the following fiscal year. And as you know, um, all of you went through the last round of service reductions. 
there uh, there isn't a whole lot of low hanging fruit left on the tree. So you know you're really faced. You would really be faced with some fundamentally impossible choices. Um, with all that said, really important to remember CARES Act one time funding. I've been involved at this level in the transit industry for over <clears throat> some number of years, <laughs> and um, <laughs> uh, and I have never seen the federal government act this quickly with this much flexibility or with this much money. So I think you know any thought that oh well they'll come back and do another round, um, I would be very skeptical. The only thing that comes close to this was the economic stimulus. Um, that came through, you know, in the first year or two of the Obama administration. That came through at about a third this level of funding and with a lot more significant strings attached, including not the ability to spend it on operating. Um, so with that, uh, Madam Chair, I just wanted to kind of bring everybody up to speed on where we are. And again, uh, this month's meeting, we have no action items on your agenda. Uh, on your agenda, but between Dan's presentation and this, it's really more to kind of tee things up for our June board meeting, where you will have a couple of action items. Does anyone, um, Steve? That was excellent, and I know um, Ed's been working with you on this as well. So great work. I mean, it's, it is where we are, right? Does anyone have any comments or? Questions or thoughts? Um, I have a I have a comment. This is Janet Miller. Can you all hear me? We can. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I can't tell if my mute's on or not. Um, I think uh, I think it's a really great work, Steve. And I think we're really fortunate that we have the CARES Act uh, in this difficult time. You know me. I'm always thinking about the messaging. Hannah and I are always thinking about the messaging and how to position this. I think it's really important in the budget hearings and in conversations with the Metro Council that we make it clear that a one-year fix is a really good thing, but that everybody needs to be thinking today about the next fiscal year because our, our ridership in this city taking a 44% cut to transit service is just not, it's not acceptable or feasible. And I would just think it would be great if, <clears throat> I know everybody's focused on this budget, but we need to already get working and advocating to be certain of the restoration because I think we all agree it would be catastrophic if we did not get those funds restored. So I would just say messaging with a long view, but also not being afraid to paint the picture that should this not be restored, you know, that it would be, you know, a, a terrible thing for the for this community. Does that make sense? Sure. It makes big sense. <laughs> yeah, it's couldn't agree with you more, Janet, because it would be very easy with all of the other massive challenges Council is going to be dealing with on this budget cycle and in this budget proposal, it would be very easy to just kind of set us aside. And mm -hmm. I think the worst scenario, you know, where we would really be legitimately accused of dropping the ball is if we get to this point next year having to have the types of radical changes you're talking about and people saying, I had no idea that this was coming. Right. Exactly. And my, my concern is I think we, we, we have a great relationship with the mayor's office and we want to be helpful and supportive. But I think this is something that as a board, we should keep our eye on and really um, rally advocating troops for this because uh, the council, they all have their eye on the whole budget. We need to be the advocates to be certain that this uh, funding is restored because even standing still is not what we want, right? So um, right. I would just say t adopting a tone which is cooperative and positive, but really yep. making it clear that that's coming down the pike. So thank you. Yep. Uh, Janet, this is Steve. Mm -hmm. Just just to react to that real quickly because of another conversation. So with all of this kind of going on and the up 
upheaval with COVID and, frankly, the fact that a lot of our office staff are working remotely, you know, frankly, when we were kicking this back and forth and doing things, we had this, I had this sort of reaction of dejection from our planning department. And finally, Felix came to me and said, does this mean we drop better bus? And I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. We need to keep better bus on the forefront. Because eventually we will come through this. And, and what's gone on with the economy, what's gone on with COVID-19, the, you know, um, intense measures that our operations and maintenance folks have had to put in place have by no means diminished our need to continue to expand and improve transit service in the community. And I know in uh, with Jason and Amanda, we've talked to several reporting entities that say, well, is this the end of mass transit? I said, on the contrary, I think it absolutely proves our essential nature. The mayor recognized us from the first days of this as one of the essential services that has to keep running. And despite the fact that, you know, we continue every day to see scary numbers in terms of not only the virus, but in terms of unemployment and economic loss, every day through this pandemic, we've had over 10,000 people rely on transit, on WeGo Public Transit Services, to get to essential services. This is with schools and universities shut down. This is with people hopefully not taking discretionary trips. Um, so the folks, and I have to confess, and maybe in violation, me, Rita might slap me, I have been on our buses, and believe me, the folks who are on them have to be on them. So it's something that we absolutely need to convey. Yeah, great. Thank you. And and I agree with you, Janet, that it is our responsibility to be advocates. And not only is it COVID, it's also people are still suffering from the storms, um, both the tornado as well as the storms that happened about two weeks ago. And um, we we have to be advocates not only for MTA we go, but also for the citizens of Nashville. And this our services are critically essential. And the work that we've done, it, it, it deserves to be able to go forward, like you just said, Steve. So uh, I agree. Um, I think we're all committing to be good advocates, as we always have been. Anyone else? Other than that, I, th I think that's what we had on that item, Madam Chair. Well, thank you. Again, I think it was a great job, very comprehensive. And, um you know, paint the real picture, which is important always. Anything further on this uh, operating budget? Well, with that, I want to remind all of you all to pay mindful attention inside your packet. There's also the marketing plan that Jason has and his staff has been working on for quite some time. And I think it, it is something that we need to also continuously pay attention to. And I think Jason is on the phone and if um, you have questions, you can contact Jason after the meeting to see if there's anything additional that you might need to help with the plan. Also, take some time and look at the monthly financial report as well as the operating uh, statistics. I think uh, it it tells a picture, and those certainly help you to understand the budget scenario even better. Um, and also, last in the packet are the procurement projects. Please make certain you take an opportunity to see that. If there's any help or assistance you can provide to Rita as those projects, please reach out to her and let her know. Um, Steve, I don't see anything further on the agenda. Uh, Madam Chair, this is Margaret. Yes. Uh, I do have something about the minutes again, and I am sorry to uh, do this, but this okay. would probably recall a uh, call for another vote. I was okay. looking, I think just it's just been difficult, you know, with this uh, new way of doing it with the audio, and I noticed that on our March 26th meeting, we did not reflect that we had approved the minutes by a roll call vote, and the minutes that were before you all uh, did not show that either. And so I'm just asking for an amendment of today's uh, minutes to reflect that, and then Monica and I will make sure the minutes look the way they're supposed to. So. Oh, uh, someone yeah. make a motion yeah. to so move what I said. <laughs> yeah, before we take a vote on that, this is Monica. I believe in our first teleconference meeting, which was in March, we did not, it was not on the agenda to approve those minutes. We were only dealing with the action items. So in that meeting, we did not have approval. We didn't call for the minutes. 
we did a so we have not approved the March 26 meeting. I two sets of minutes. Well, then let's do this. Yeah, I think we did approve the minutes last time. Yeah. Right. Well, whether I think we have, uh, and I know that you all have seen them. So I think if you just uh, make sure that you uh, – uh, what we have in these minutes, we need to reflect in our minutes that the previous meeting's minutes were approved. So if you would just give me – if you would all move that, and then we can make sure the minutes reflect that. Yes, I think we did approve the March 26 minutes, and I think we also approved – I have my company. We also Thank approved the much. February 27th meeting. Right. Minute. So, only right. thing we need is what you're saying is for our April meeting that it be reflected that we approved those minutes at that meeting, right? And right. Right. The minutes call. before you okay. did not show that, and the minutes of the March 26 meeting don't either. So, if you just move that the meeting that the minutes reflect the approval of the minutes, we'll straighten them out. Yeah. Perfect. So, we need a motion. Okay. Janet Miller, so moved. And is there a second? That's not going to do it. We need a motion <laughs> to do exactly what was requested. <laughs> All right, Walter, you get to make the motion then. <laughs> I move that the minutes currently unapproved are now approved. It's a minute. What we need to do is well, have the minutes that were presented to you today reflect that the March 26th meeting minutes were amended. I mean, okay, they just so I will, they weren't well, in I there. Will, <laughs> I will submit them to, at, at the conclusion of this meeting, I will send the revised version to Margaret, and once uh, we have them in order, we'll send them back out to the board. I will correct and revise the minutes per Margaret's request. Okay, so let me just go back a minute. So I think we'll, I, we have approved, because I see my signature on them, the, we have approved both the March 26th and the February 27th Correct. meetings. Correct. What we have, what was not in the minutes that we approved earlier in this meeting right. was right. content to say that we have approved them by roll call at right. the right. April meeting. Got so it. that's all we got it. say. Right. Got right. It. That's so right. what we need, all I need is someone to make a motion to include in today's minutes that in April these minutes were approved by roll. I got, I got it. This is Hannah. I so move that <laughs> be amended to show that we approved the April minutes last month. The, right. The March and the March and the March the March the March February March. meetings. I, in April, okay. There's a motion, and then there's second. a second, and then the second. So, second. so there's a motion and a second, and so we'll do a roll call mm -hmm. right quick. So who approves? Um, Janet Miller, do you approve? Janet Miller approves. Hannah Paramore Breen, do you approve? Hannah Paramore Breen approves. Walter Searcy, do you approve? I certainly do. And Gilcar William approves, so you have your motion and the minutes to be amended to reflect the motion. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for um, making certain you keep us straight as our board secretary. We always do, always have, and I'm always appreciative, so thank you very much. Thank you. Um, if there's nothing further, Steve, do you have anything further? He does, he does not. He does not. Well, here's my wish is that everyone goes forth, be safe, take care of one another, and take care of your family. And, again, my special thanks to all of you out there to take care of our city so well and allow us to get to and from we need to be where we need to be in this difficult time. You all are, are great, and I appreciate you all very much and proud to be part of this board. That being said, I move for adjournment. Second. Second. So we're all, we're adjourned. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody.